Good afternoon. We would like to welcome you to the driving forces behind a creative economy session. We're excited to have you here. We're looking forward to a conversation with some very creative people, as well as with you, about how do we construct a world, how do we construct an economy that is full of creativity and thrives. And one of our assumptions here is that creative economies are driven by creative people, individuals who are champions, new champions, people who change the world, people who challenge the status quo. And that kind of challenging often happens at the intersection of two very different ways of looking at the world. And if I were to go into a room and put a pure artist on one side of the room and a pure business person on the other side of the room, I would expect some creative conversations going on there or perhaps no conversations going on there. But what we're trying to suggest is that by merging artistic beauty, beauty ways of looking at the world with a business way of looking at the world, is actually the intersection of creative economies. You know, Steve Jobs was not alone in, in looking at creativity as something beautiful. And what we're going to try to do today is figure out how can economic systems, how can political systems, how can organizations, how can I, perhaps even as a leader of a team, create an environment that fuels that kind of conversation across different worlds, perhaps artists and business people. And those sorts of conversations deliver real economic results, and we'll talk a bit about that later. I'm excited today to be with you with several new champions, people who are making a difference, people who have lived innovatively, people from the art side, people from the business side, and in between. And so we're going to first hear from Sola Liu, who is a composer, vocalist, and writer. She's the founder of Liu Sola uh, Music Studio. I said that wrong at the beginning. I apologize. Um, but she's an artist and great at what she does at combining tradition with the world we're living in. We'll then hear from Kenny Lowe, who is a chief executive officer at City College and O School in Singapore. He's doing some very creative work with dance and other areas in terms of social entrepreneurship. Then we'll hear from Peter Corbett, who is the chief executive officer of iStrategy Labs and essentially a global shaper trying to, to change things out there. And then finally, we'll hear from Jens Martin Skibstead, who is the founding partner of Skibstead Ideation and basically is pushing hard at the global level, trying to change policy to support creatives in any economy. So we'll start with Sola. Oh, again, <laughs> start. Um, <laughs> I'm going to speak in Chinese, if you don't mind. When we talk about the creative economy, uh, I myself am an artist, and I approach the issue from the perspective of creation. And creativity. To artists and perhaps others, creativity is an object of controversy. What is contemporary? What is modern? What is uh, traditional? What is classical? In my own view,
When we talk about the contemporary, we need to be very, very clear about what forms exist in the contemporary. When we talk about the past, or when we talk about the ancient or the classical, what forms, what classical forms are in play here? And you'll find a lot of commonalities. A lot of in the classics, in the traditions, you will find in enlightenment and inspiration, innovation. So the transcendence, the transformation from the classical to the modern or the contemporary, is a journey of inspiration and exploration. We need to deeply understand the this transformation between the past and the contemporary. Uh, and I, I emphasize transformation in, in, in film, film or in literature and many forms of art. We see that the artist uses a twist. And the twist is the crux of the story. It's the crucial element of any plot. And the, this, the transformation from the classical to the contemporary, that perhaps is the greatest twist. So let me take an example from music. When you hear a sound, uh, for example, from classical Chinese music, Ding, ding, da, 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 da. Ding, ding, da, 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 da. When you hear this, these notes, ding, ding, da, 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 da. this is a, a classical Chinese musical element. It could come from the kipa, any of the traditional Chinese instruments. But then give it a twist. Make it mine. Own it. That little ha 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 at the end becomes my own, my own addition, my own twist on this classical, on this classical note. And it instantly becomes modern. It's a classical form that I have owned, that I have embodied. Here I am, I'm knocking on a table. I'm an artist, I'm a musician, knocking on a table. No, you might say, what, what is this? Uh-oh. And now, all of a sudden, <laughs> this knocking <laughs> has become <laughs> music of my own. And that's another twist. So these twists of, of sound uh, for a musician in working uh, with this element is a, a process of, of taking something external and making it one's own energy, one's own creative energy. 
啊。啊，噔噔噔噔噔噔噔噔噔，一个简单的传统的音乐，到这儿以后变成了现代能量，是哈哈哈哈哈哈，就有了一个现代的能量。所以呢，音乐家当有个性，你自己的现代的能量，你自己当今的能量，你自己找到的时候，如果你在一个集体中，一个 group， 一个集体的时候，你怎么样去找到这能量？比如说十个音乐家。如果十个音乐家，我可能不要求十个音乐家都懂得历史或者传统。No, 他只要懂得他面前面对的是什么，他面前面对的这个音符是什么意思，他要会这个转换，就一下子把这个音符转换到自己身上以后，给他能量，而不是感觉这就是音符，这就是我的工作，我跟这个没有关系，我把它弄完了，我拿了钱就走，这就是没有转换。转换就是音符在这儿，你在这儿，你要让它过来变。Even a physical process, the 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 actual sound waves coming through your body and giving expression to them in your own unique way. So my music group has ten vocalists. Oh, I'm I'm trying to play something. Am I supposed to press some buttons? Please play the video. Whoever's manipulating the machines, can you please play the video? Thank you. Okay. You can see that 你们看那边的那个琵琶，另外还有后边的鼓啊。所以呢，我想就是说，能量就是每一个人给他自己个人的能量，在一个组里边，这个能量集中起来，可能就比我们原来想象的一般的十个能量，十个人的能量要大。我想说的就是这个意思。One one person's energy can be more powerful than ten people's energy. It's all about your individual expression. Sorry. Well done. Thank you very much. Sorry. Kenny, thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm going to share about uh, my experience in, in the creative economy in, in Singapore. I'd like to take the story back uh, to my schooling years. I, I grew up in the mu with the music of uh, MC Hammer and Vanilla Ice. I'm not sure if anyone, you know, oh, yeah. you can touch this and all the shuffling and all that. So dance has been a part of my life. Uh, I think through dance, uh, I build up my self-esteem and, and I learn how to express myself. And, and that's quite important and rather rare among the mainstream education focus in Singapore. So I began to appreciate uh, the dancers. And six years ago, uh, I met this particular guy called Ryan. Ryan is a professional dancer in, in Singapore. He can jump up in the air and just split his legs. And sometimes he can lift up his legs and kind of lick his knee and all that. So I recognize that there are, there are people that have special abilities. It gives you know when when they listen to music, they can create just movements on the spot in their mind, and and straight away replicate them on the spot and remember them, which for me will take maybe five six hours or five months. But the sad part is that the, there is no space in the economy in in Singapore for such talents. So many of them, their only jobs is just to dance on bar tops at the, at the clubs, you know, and they'll just engage for some. New Year, year-end shows. And, and the sad part is that in order to show off their talents to the world, they have to adapt to a lifestyle which they may not want to. So Ryan will have to stay back in the club to drink with the bosses in, in order to get his next gig because he needs to socialize. You know? So that's, that's pretty sad. So six years ago, we, we took a radical step. We set up the first uh, street dance company in, in Singapore. So I went around Singapore to scout for all the best street dancers, those that can spin on their heads very well, that can move like robots and all that. <laughs> so we hired all of them, gave them a, a good basic salary so that just like the rest of Singaporeans, they have what we call the CPF and able to afford public housing. 
and we, we create a business model that's built around their, their talent. So what is amazing is that uh, this, this small little outfit has, has grown to impact about 10,000 young people every year. So every week we are seeing 1,500 young people coming to take dance classes. So young people are actually supporting young people to, to turn pro in their craft. And, and what is encouraging is that we are seeing the, the, the private brands, commercial brands coming to us and then they say that we would like to sponsor your events because we would like the young people to remember our logo when they grow up and then make sure they drink our drink and buy our computers. And, and we have the government sector coming to us because through our events, we are able to engage young people at a very high level. They can all come together and, and somehow that music and that movement on stage kind of just resonate among the young people. And when we talk to them, they say things like, dance gave me courage dance make me feel accepted. I think it's a sense that they feel that they fit like for that one minute on stage together with that pounding bass and they do their tuk, 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 just feel that everything makes sense and they are not judged and then, and then they feel good about themselves. So we're seeing a lot of like social benefits and economic benefits in the area of performing arts. And then on a, on a bigger scale, um, we are also noticing that the Singapore government is going to invest quite a bit in, in the area of arts and culture in order to sustain our economic growth. I think for the past 40 years, we've invested a lot in, in the basic structures like roads, you know, banking system and all that. But now we have come to a stage which lifestyle is important, that we won't, don't just want Singapore to just be a trade hub or economic hub, but a place where people call home. So, so arts and culture has come to the center of the play because that's the point where we can find emotional connectedness and, and our government is also trying to use the arts to, to help the citizens to have life after work, to, to be able to enjoy the economic gains, I think, to be able to feed their soul so that they don't just walk around feeling frustrated by the congested trains and all and, and learn how to smell the roses and all. So, so that's my perspective. On, on driving the creative economy. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's my turn. All right. Um, so I'm Peter Corbett. I'm the CEO of iStrategy Labs. And I think my story is um, it's really about a move away from the individual craftsmen, the focus on a specific discipline, and maybe what some people would call a renaissance man or woman. And, and I guess my story starts at about nine years old is when I started programming. Um, I became a designer in my teens really fell in love with graphic design and web design. Uh, when I went to college, I actually went to business school. So think about that as the, the art of business in a way. Uh, and started a concert production company. So big physical events, bringing people together around music and, and art and fashion, etc. And then after uh, graduating from business school, I became a TV producer. So you can think about content production and animation, etc. And then worked for a number of ad agencies and started iStrategy Labs five years ago uh, in my apartment which is really a combination of all of those things. Um, our, our tools, our, our media that we use is essentially code uh, and pixels, right? So we do a lot of uh, application development, web design, mobile design and development uh, for Fortune 500. So I think the creative economy uh, to me is really one that's incredibly lucrative and incredibly commercial. Um, the work that we do is not necessarily just for the beauty of it. Um, it, it absolutely has an intention to drive um, sales, uh, to drive brand awareness, to um, change behavior, all of those things. And what I'm seeing is the, some of the most successful and some of the most interesting people that I come across um, aren't just the best designer, um, or they're not just the best industrial designer, for example. They may be a programmer um, who also happens to be an industrial designer who, instead of during their day job, goes home at night, builds a, a little uh, three-dimensional version of an iPhone case, puts it up on Kickstarter, gets it funded, and all of a sudden they've got a quarter million dollars in sales and a new product that they're marketing because they have enough of a, an understanding of each of those disciplines to be effective at it. That's not really something that when you're growing up is easy to understand as a possible career path at all. Uh, and that was stressful for me, to be honest. Um, as I was growing up, as I mentioned, I was a designer and a developer and all these things, but I was never the best at any of those. So while my friends were winning awards, for being number one, whatever, I wasn't. And everyone was saying, Peter, you're so you're smart and creative and talented, but I wasn't winning 
awards and no one's really calling it out. And, and it was just that my talent is actually the combination of all of those disciplines. And now as the CEO of a, a creative company, it's about orchestrating the production of really interesting things um, by other people who are really good at a number of things as well. Now, mind you, our, our design team is incredibly good at design and our engineering team is incredibly good at engineering and our strategists are incredible strategists. Uh, but I think in this economy that we live in, uh, and specific to the creative economy, um, we have to understand that the people who are going to thrive and be successful in it may not just be the world's best painter or the world's best dancer or the world's best musician. Um, there's a whole field, hundreds of thousands of people that are really good at a combination of these things. And because our distribution channels have changed, specifically the Internet being uh, predominant, we now have an outlet for those strange combinations of what we do. Thank you. So when I was uh, 22, I took my girlfriend of the time uh, down to Barcelona and uh, we were supposed to have a nice holiday together and we saw these beautiful uh, uh, modernist buildings by Califac and uh, Gaudi and Domenech Montana. And uh, instead of uh, spending most of the holiday uh, with her, I started drawing bikes and uh, I drew a lot of them and it kind of annoyed her. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I got this idea to, to make a special kind of bike, and I tried to forget about it because my background at that time was philosophy, and it didn't make any sense. Um, I, I didn't manage to forget, and many years later, I started uh, that company. And um, uh, one of the reasons that I was able to start was because in Denmark, one had set up a foundation uh, that would uh, help you with developing uh, technological innovations and uh, we got quite uh, substantial funding in, in the beginning uh, then it actually was uh, a kind of a success and uh, I thought uh, now I would get the, the, the prizes uh, that you didn't get uh, Peter <laughs> and uh, so I, I wanted to send this uh, the, the first bike we made was designed by a, a designer called Mark Newson who's Australian and I sent it into this uh, Danish uh, design prize and we could not get uh, accepted simply because uh, this guy was Australian. So I, I first realized that um, politics matters for design-led companies. So uh, why do uh, design matter for the world? Well, um, the, the rest of my journey, I think, uh, can um, display a little bit of that then. Um, the, the idea around these bikes was to... Um, uh, get the cars out of the city. I had uh, for some years been uh, uh, riding at uh, riots, uh, shouting uh, with uh, thousands of people that uh, the cars should uh, go out of the city. And uh, basically what people uh, got out of that is oh, there there are some extremists. So the extremist route uh, didn't really have any effect. So I thought another route which would be about attracting people uh, to something instead of scaring them away from something or regulating them away from something would be uh, better. So uh, that's uh, w w what we did and, and we used design, uh, so aesthetics, to achieve that. And, and I think in th there is this kind of preconception that, um, that design is this uh, kind of uh, luxurious thing for, uh, for, for rich uh, people, but uh, uh, design, as I see it, is more, uh, it's more related to when uh, a bird dances around for half an hour to get a mate. It's about expressing who you are, expressing your lifestyle, and, um, and, and basically that is a much more fundamental uh, thing to you uh, to get laid or to progenerate or to make sure your family goes on than uh, if the world goes under or not. Um, I mean, of course, these bikes are set in place in order to uh, reduce carbon gas uh, emissions they're set in place to reduce pollution etc but people don't really care about that they are, well at least much less than they do about expressing who they are and therefore design and aesthetics in general is an extremely powerful source that needs to be harnessed and i think it's weird that we have a world where this uh, this incredibly strong motivator is not anyhow regulated internationally. So right now, there are some local design policies, which basically is about uh, out-competing each other. China is also setting up uh, a design policy these days, and China is doing so, so that they can out-compete other regions. Denmark, where I come from, they also have that, so we can out-compete other regions. But this is not a thing that the world necessarily will benefit from unless we figure out how the, uh, design can help the world at large. 
Thank you, Jens. I hope you get, I had the luxury of visiting with each of them much longer before we ever had this conversation here today. And they are new champions. They are creatives. This is the work they do, all four of them. And so one of the questions I'd like to ask each of you, or you can answer however you want to or in what order, but it's, it's basically what are some of the biggest barriers that either in the beginning when you started down that creative mm. path or now that you've built something that is an incredibly creative organization that builds a vibrant creative economy, what are one or two of the biggest barriers, either personally or organizationally, you face trying to do your work well that yeah, make I'll, it hard? I'll share one because it, it's sort of foundational to who I am. Um, when I was growing up, I was always starting businesses, uh, whatever they may be, and creative ones of, of some kind. And all of my friends, uh, and thankfully not my parents, but all of my friends would basically tell me that I was crazy. And that word, I heard the word, you're crazy, the phrase, you're crazy, I don't know, hundreds of times. <laughs> and to be able to survive that is crucial for a creative person. I think all creative people, if you're actually doing something interesting, people are going to say that you're crazy. Um, and if you can start to tune that out, uh, you'll block that noise. It's something I learned early on. Um, if you can block that noise you'll really start to hear um, yourself and what you really want to do and what you're really passionate about, and you won't let the outside world dilute that. And if you do let the outside world dilute that, you end up being pretty mediocre. And what that has turned in for me is a deep fear of mediocrity. It's the thing that drives me every single day. And no matter how beautiful the thing is that we might design and the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people that might be exposed to the campaigns that we do, I still think, ah, oh, man, was that really that good? Was it mediocre? And I hope in, in my later years, maybe I'll start to be satisfied, but I doubt it. So it's a process for me of living my life having been called crazy and now being in a state of fear of mediocrity that will keep driving me to, um, I think, do better and a better job wherever I can. Just a quick follow-up sure. on that. Are there people, experiences, things that help you stay crazy? <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. I would say so. Um, I'd say I, I travel a tremendous amount, um, and the exposure to brand-new stimuli is crucial. So... I do almost 200,000 miles a year. Um, after this, I'll go to Taipei and Shanghai and Moscow, Berlin, Tallinn, and Zagreb, many of those places I've never been. And that will um, just change the way that my, my brain works to a certain degree and say, oh, what I thought was possible, or the way that we do things in the States or Washington, D.C., it's not the way they do it in Tianjin. It's not the way they do it in Taipei. It's not the way they do it in Moscow. And so when I come back to the States and apply that to my work, I'll say, we don't have to do it the way that other people do it. And, oh, that, thi that little thing you saw in a market in Seoul, how can that now be brought into a consumer-facing marketing campaign for Volkswagen for, or Audi or whomever else we may work with? Well, sure. Thank you. Others? I think for, for us it's about uh, the barrier to, to scale. I think when, when we are small, nobody wants to talk to you. Then, then suddenly when you can have a lot of young people watching your videos, going to your events, and you start to have different agencies coming to you to want to work with you. And then when that happens, their agenda comes in. So, so the challenge is how do we balance the artistic integrity with what the, the corporates want then? You know? At which point will we come to a point which we actually cross the line and, and we actually kind of turn commercial and, and lose uh, our original value and intention? So there's always a a balancing act over there because brands will want more presence then they'll say can your dancers wear our logos on your on their clothes you know on the shoes at the background and all but if you have too much of that i mean dance is not like a f1 formula one race where it's just engine all the stickers doesn't matter you know the costume with too much logos actually would take away the the, the artistic message so um on one hand there is there is a great need for greater resource to bring the art form to the masses. On the other hand, there, there has to be a balance and, and a better understanding and negotiation you know, with the potential stakeholders and funders. So that's the challenge that we have. And again, a, a question that raises for me is, as you try to balance between the demands of sponsors and the, the desires of the artists to dance the way they want to without being a Formula One car, um, 
Are there things that you do or tools or approaches that help you personally when you're in that negotiation space balance things better? I, I think we, we show them that, that they need to take a longer-term position, that the brands need to build a relationship with our audience. That means to position themselves as, as somebody that support the art form rather than somebody that take advantage of the art form. I think there's a, there's a big difference on that. Mm. So, so the, the bigger brands, they can see a longer term, so they will respect our views and the boundaries of how much their logos can encroach into. Yeah. Hmm. So, so uh, I think, I, I escaped the personal problem because, uh, you know, uh, being a Chinese in my generation, I really, we all know that I grown up in the uh, country, uh, the time I grown up, there's completely no information about anything. So for us, we have to go abroad to study what we, we, you know, we want to know. Um, but after I come back, uh, so this is already, there's lots of difficulty. After we come back, I come back, I start to do lot, uh, events in China. Uh, now I find not, you know, there's for many young musicians, what are they facing? The problem is we totally lack of uh, information. We have really don't have enough information to have, to uh, uh, educate young people to let them know what is really behind the contemporary art, uh, modern music, all kinds of different kind of art form, different kind of music form, what is really going on, what's behind that. The young musicians, they just uh, don't wait to really find out. Um, this is the, a real problem, not only musicians, also for ordinary students. Um, no way to find out what's really going on with, uh, uh, with music. You know like mm. uh, and globally. Mm. I think that's very important for Chinese uh, 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 young generation to, to have more information, also understanding. What we have is misunderstanding the world. We really, because we don't have enough information, that's why uh, we always misunderstanding the message we get. You know, we, we, something, if uh, uh, some Chinese people see, and they grab it without really understand. Then sometimes we could mess up, you know, like this very good opportunity for you to produce something, but you could mess up because you actually missed the message. You don't know what's really behind. So then also the word to China too, like uh, uh, when I was overseas as musicians, uh, to work in overseas, I find it's really hard to do the culture exchange because uh, internationally, we also get misunderstood uh, mm. uh, because uh, also I think internationally also lack of real information about what's really, you know, uh, as Chinese and what is real Chinese culture. Also, there's lots of very superficial information in the world too. So I think uh, that, that, you know, like, that's what I can talk about today, yeah. Could you explain just a little bit more between the difference for you as an artist in physically going someplace and hearing different music versus going online and just listening to it on the internet? Does, does one approach make That's you... That's a big difference. You go online to listen, you probably just get an idea of, oh, what this sounds like. So young kids sometimes cry about, oh, you know what the trends is. But that's not true. You know, you only know the trends, what, you know, that pop star, what does she wear, you know, or what is going on in England or America, that's, you don't know exact, you don't, you don't know the real life of musicians' life, being a musician. So some people, like in China, maybe lots of young people go crazy about uh, musicians in the Western world because of the media, because of what they saw from television or from uh, 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 commercials. This is about the real musicians' life. It's, yeah. So I think what we really we need is the real information. So to live like a musician, to know really philosophy of being a musician. There's many philosophy. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's you. Well, I, I, I really recognized what uh, Peter said. And uh, I, when I started, well, or before I started that bike company, I was sitting in the canteen in the philosophy uh, uh, at the university and I was drawing bikes and my friends 
would come over and look at me a little bit uh, sad, you know, poor guy, now he's drawing these absurd bikes and uh, instead of, you know, <laughs> focusing on his studies. Um, and, and actually, uh, you know, I, I felt I had an idea. I, did, I, I was not disturbed by, by this. And actually, I use that a little bit today as a criteria. When, uh, when people think, okay, this is a little bit too far out, then I know, ah, okay, then I'm on to something. Because... Um, I mean, of course, I could also be totally wrong, but, but uh, then I just wait a while, and if the idea sticks, then I, I'm pretty sure. And, um, and, and, and the reason that I think that is because, you know, let, let's say, um, you know, so, so what, one of my uh, projects right now is to, to make an electric car for a specific sub-Saharan uh, market. And the people I speak to, um, mainly Indians that cater to that market, they're like, okay, it's fine, but it's science fiction. And then, you know, but that's my only chance is that they think this is science fiction because if they just went in there full speed ahead, you know, I would have no chance because I'm an individual and they're big corporates. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so, so actually, it also gives you uh, some time. And, it, and, it, and if you manage to break through that market, you have an entire new market to yeah. yourself. That's a really interesting point I'd like to elaborate on just quickly. I think those of us who are deeply involved in the creative economy, um, we're piercing that, that bubble of possibility where the corporates are a little too afraid to go after. And we're happy to break right through into a, a, what is a blue ocean and exploit that. Um, and so that's our constant battle. We're thinking, where is, where is it a blue ocean? It's a red ocean over here. And who is going to... Who's going to copy us? Who's going to steal our work if we actually break through and find a thing that we can monetize? Again, I have to say that we're very, very focused on the commercialization of the kind of work that we do. Um, it's because we're a for-profit and we're, we're not necessarily an arts collective. And the thing I, I tell our employees is the only difference between iStrategy Labs and a, an arts collective is that people actually pay us a tremendous amount of money to bring our ideas to life. And it would be nice for us just to, 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 to tinker and be craftsmen, and I would love to do that. Um, but right now, we, we have a lot of mouths to feed, so to speak, and we're, we're growing and I think have a lot of great work to do. So um, having the structure we do is the right one. Well, cre creative economies really are. It's, it's, it's a balancing act between creatives, people with very disruptive ideas, pushing the challenge, challenging the status quo, pushing the edge, and those folks who literally excel at getting things done. They're the go-to people. When you have to get somewhere, when you have to get something accomplished, you know that they will accomplish it. And often, more often than not, they're different people. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like, for example, in your world, somehow you've learned to work together. Yeah. How, how, how do you do that? Yeah, what, it's a lot what of... What helps uh, you uh, or any of you? Because, you know, yeah. artists are on the other side. Yeah. Somehow, those two folks have to work together for the economy to creative, or it just becomes an economy, or it just becomes creative, and, and one without the other just doesn't work well. I think it's actually very simple. Um, we look for the marriage between what someone's passion is and what the opportunity is that we have. And if we can match those two up, you know, if we're working with uh, Ford or Coca-Cola or whomever, and someone says, all I really want to do is paint murals all day long, well, if we can find the commercial context for them to do it in, they're going to paint the most beautiful murals you've ever seen, and they're going to be incredibly passionate about it. Instead of forcing someone into something, they might not really be that passionate about. So that intersection of opportunity and passion is where we see so much energy. It's when you stay up for you know, days at a time producing work which others might not have been able to do or thought was possible. Mm. Uh, I missed one, 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 one point I'd like to, to say. Um, so uh, that, therefore that because of the lack of information, so for me I think um, in China, we need lots of organization to have uh, like all kinds of different kind of forum. That's why when you ask me about uh, internet information, I think that's not enough to just like listen to music. For example, I would like to. Uh, we have already organized uh, a cross music, new music cross boundary forum in Beijing Modern Music Festival in, uh, in the Central Conservatory. So that's what we're trying to do. I think this kind of international uh, cross-boundary forum discussions, like with many different artists come to China, um, a real person, real artist or scholar, or, you know, like they come here, musicians come together to discuss the, the, like today, that, like a, a, a real discussion that will be really helpful for young Chinese. Hmm. Uh, hmm. I think in terms of uh, organization, 
Uh, right now, the way a lot of uh, corporates, they try to deal with this is that they um, take some of their managers through a ton of uh, creative uh, processes. You know, so they, uh, they sit there and brainstorm and have all sorts of techniques to get their managers more creative. I personally uh, don't believe in that uh, technique. I think uh, the, the way to have a successful creative business is to emulate successful creative businesses. And you can just look at them and see what they do, and you do the same. So it's, in, in fact, fairly easy. And uh, so, so, for instance, the film industry, uh, you know, they, they have, uh, you know, globally a turnover that's significant. How do they do it? Well, they have a director who does that. They have a producer that does that. You have, uh, uh, what, what are they called, ad agencies, there you have an art director who, who's a mediator between the two kind of characters you're talking about, the strictly corporate kind of guy and the creative kind of guy. And, and, and that kind of mediator between uh, the creative uh, and uh, the, the strictly, uh, strictly managerial, they exist in all creative businesses. And you just got to uh, make that function work within your company. So I think it's very doable um, and yeah, to be had. Martin, while, while we, can, we could replicate the, the frameworks and the structure, do you think culture could be transferred? Because design, creativity, a lot of it is, is in the unseen, it's, it's in the culture, it's not just in the positions. So companies, you, you can't really yeah. emulate cultures. Like, I mean, for example, you know, in Singapore you have McDonald's and KFC, both selling fast food. You walk in, you sense a very different culture altogether. Well, I I'd like to think that we, we could, but I'm really, I think, a bit cynical on that front. And we work with big Fortune 500s, and the idea that our tiny group of people that might work on a project will affect that yeah. hulking global organization and change the way that they think is a bit ambitious. I, I wish that was the case. The reality is that I spend a lot of my time um, trying to protect our creatives from being uh, changed by them. So that's the role of an account manager, an account executive person in an agency organization. You want to make sure the art directors and the designers don't get, they don't have their creativity crushed by what can be incredibly bureaucratic processes in big companies. But I think there, I agree with what you say about it, but, but I think there is a way to do it. So instead, of course, uh, you know, creativity is like a virus. You, if you put it in there, then it's going to spread. <laughs> but, um, but, but, but the, 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 the way you do it, if, it's, you, if you don't want the whole organism to be contaminated, what you do is you create a little subsidiary. So uh, if it's, for instance, uh, some kind of product you want to make, well, then you make a separate brand, a sub-brand or whatever for that, and then you create a new culture within that. And if it's a successful uh, product, it can grow. And at some point, uh, you know, it can overtake the mother company if it's really... Uh, th that's significant. So there are, there are strategies to handle these cultural uh, challenges. I think the big companies are they're open to this kind of infection more than they ever have been before. But I don't know if we've fully seen a wholesale changeover uh, in the called in the Fortune 500. Has some company gone from being you know dull and bureaucratic to incredibly creative and innovative? I, I haven't. I don't know if we've seen that coin flip. I'd love to see it. And what what would that look like? I don't know. I know a couple of companies. Intuit started, I think, as a very creative company, and then it slipped for a variety of reasons. And then Scott, the founder, re came back into the system, worked mm -hmm. with a lot of people, and is now, from my observation, pulling them back up. Mm -hmm. But it took a creative founder coming back into the system to mm -hmm. do it. Um, Starbucks, arguably, is a similar mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. You know, they had a curve of great success, then a very downward pitch curve, and then, mm. you know. <laughs> Schultz, what's Howard it, Schultz, what's interesting he about came both, back, he came back yeah. a different person when he came to, to round two. What's interesting about both those examples is their top-down driven change from someone who's already had a lot of buy-in. I, I don't, I would love to see, has the bottom-up occurred? Have the 20-somethings who are just coming into the corporate world been like, this place is crazy, let's change it, and been given the control and the power to do so? And, and maybe we're going to start to see that over the next decade or so. Yeah, and, and that remains to be seen because if you if you uh, see the like the, the, the truly creative companies, they are run top down and they are often entrepreneurial led. Because if you see uh, the way uh, like organizational structures are set up, they are set up to um, uh, to divide and rule. They are set up to 
disempower people so uh, so you make sure they don't do crazy things or take over power from from you uh, what you know for for crea- creativity to be truly effective you need to uh, like dictate it uh, Creativity is not a democratic yeah. action, yeah. and so therefore you see, uh, like a semi-dictator, like people like Steve Jobs that have super creative uh, companies, where, whereas uh, uh, Microsoft, that's not in the same way top top down led, they yeah. don't. I mean, their their types of creativity or innovations, they have not been as successful. Which uh, raises an interesting opportunity to to move our conversation a bit more into your space. Um, Do you have examples in your countries, your regions, your own organization where where it did change, where things did become more innovative? How did that happen? Please. We have a microphone right here. There we go. I'm Sheila. Mm-hmm. I'm an architect practicing for 35 years from India. And I empathize and I live through all your whatever you have said because I do feel that um, being creative you know there are many many ways that your design can get sabotaged that's what i call them but um, i think it is beyond a point if you persevere i think you may not be able to have too many clients but you have clients who matter and after a point if the clients designs are successful or your buildings are successful i think the others will follow since so. my uh, mm-hmm. my father is an architect and i don't wish the profession on anyone um, the lack of appreciation especially in the western world for architecture is abhorrent we buy homes out of boxes in america uh, it's disgusting and that discipline is uh, one of the most it's It's the most it, it's the most important art form that I think that we have. We all live in a built structure, or many of us do. Um, so, mm. I don't know if we're ever going to see a return to the appreciation of architecture. I hope that we do. Mm. Hmm. Yes. Again, brief comments or questions about how do we support you know a creative economy? How maybe in your own organization do you create a creative economy? Support creatives, please. Well, I just wanted to make the observation that um, that creativity takes courage as well. Not just in the evolution of ideas, that's sort of the first half, but somebody mentioned Steve Jobs before, and there seems like there's still an underutilization of this courage to say no, to kill amazing ideas, brilliant ideas, but not the right ones for now. And, and it seems that when we talk about creativity, normally we're just talking about the brainstorming, the, it, you know, the, the, the first half. But without the second half, you actually don't get full innovation. Uh, you just get lots of ideation, and it's not quite the same thing. I just was curious about your thoughts about the second half of creativity. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I can say personally, in ter- like, uh, my... In- entire life is mainly about killing my own ideas because you just can't make the make them happen you know so so of course i ideas without implementation are worthless and you will find that somehow um so, somehow people uh, carry out your thoughts if you don't do it yourself i i've met so many creators that said ah That's fun. I thought of that, you know. So somehow we all get roughly the same idea at roughly the same time, and pyramids get built all over the world <laughs> roughly at the same time, you know. So uh, yeah, the, and, and so so killing is the main job. Yeah, killing ideas. Yeah. I think it's a really great point. Um, when I first started the company, uh, it was only me, so it was hard to do all the execution, and I I tried to just do the strategy work and all the ideation work because I always had great ideas and I really knew how to express them. Um, but I realized that the the ideation part was not really what people valued. Um, they really valued the execution component. I would say that 95% of our revenue is derived from making things, whether it's you know writing code or pushing pixels around or building a physical thing in the world. Um, and the ideation piece is really just the hook. Um, that's the like get them really excited, and now we're now we're actually working on something. I think it's, it comes in stages. I think for for us. Uh Right at the start, we have to decide to do something. The ship needs, needs to leave the dock, but, 
But as we say, we realize that some of the calls we made were bad, and then we have to shift, you know. But of course, when an organization becomes very big, when you have a lot of resources, there you have to chop off more ideas to, to, to retain your particular focus. So, so I think it's, it's a stage of an organization. My, my, my answer probably is not very useful for you because <laughs> I'm an artist. Uh, but for like contemporary art uh, 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 creation, I think you have to be careful to get too personal. Because uh, the, like, the, uh, like modern music or contemporary music, what we need is to build this extremely uh, individuality, but not too personal. I mean, one, of, one of the interesting tensions that's being raised here is the issue of you know, people who are good at creativity and those who are good at getting things done. And as I listen to this conversation, and I hear Peter, for example, <clears throat> describing his attempts in a creative organization to protect his creators from the world out there that is contracting to, to do things with him. It reminds me of a couple of words that when they happen in a relationship, incredible things come to pass. And the words are honor and respect. And Peter, I think you, you've got to protect your people because those other people on the other side who are buying your services... I don't think they really honor and respect yeah. what you do, yeah. but it's also got to go the other way, which is, you know, your folks have to honor sure. and respect them, and, and when there's that meeting mutual ground of honor and respect around creative economies happen when both parts are vibrant, mm -hmm. when the folks who get things done have that kind of value and respect, and the folks who also create the new ideas have some honor in the system, then really interesting things seem to happen. It's a really interesting point. Um, the root of that is actually ignorance. Um, it's not that the clients that might hire us are bad people, and so they're not going to honor and respect us. They just don't actually know what the process is and how things get created in the world and how they need to leave people alone sometimes. And so mm. any of us who works with clients in a creative industry, you, you know how to do your job. And once you have enough feedback from your client, you know what the goal is, they really should leave you alone, but oftentimes they, this is like the first time they're doing something cool and creative and they want to get their hands in there and you're like, actually, this is going to make it really awful, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we have to balance that every single day when we're managing our engagements, which is like, how do you let them you know, get their fingers in the dough a little bit without destroying the eventual uh, bread that you're going to bake? My metaphor is awful now, sorry. <laughs> and I think in terms of honor and respect, that, oh, sorry. Uh... Okay, I just want to say you also got to respect yourself and your own heritage. Uh, now, since we, we are here in China, uh, you know, I've, uh, I've met many Chinese that want to kind of figure out, okay, so what kind of, you know, how, how should these products uh, look like? And, and I think you also got to look uh, to your own uh, heritage and respect your own heritage. If you take the first design product um, in the world was actually a Chinese uh, arrow, because for the army you needed standardized arrows. Uh, if you have some of the big Danish classics are actually inspired by, um, by, by Chinese tradition. So th there's so much heritage, uh, heritage to be had and that okay, now we, co co coincidentally we are in China, so I'm talking about China, but th this is true for any culture. So, so that respect also needs to go inwards and not uh, only towards uh, others. Mm. Good point. One or two more questions, please. Uh, I want to ask a question with uh, Chinese. Uh, I'm Secretary General of the Brand China Industry Union. Uh, I've been a designer what? for 10 years. Uh, my question is, uh, woman, Zhu He, woman, Zhu He, just like Tiga woman, when we're dealing with our clients, how can we make them valueless? In China, you design for your clients, don't pay you for the design. For example, when you are in the architecture area, or in the home furnishing area, design doesn't get you paid. It's not about the design. My firm used to be the first company in China to design for the design industry. Now, the first company in China to design for the design industry. 
One of the biggest, uh, 但是呢，我在我的公司里面我依然非常的苦恼。Still, 就是说，设计客户总是会指手画脚，总是会提很多呃很不合理的要求。所以呢，我身边的很多很优秀的设计师现在都已经放弃了，都不再做设计。这些，但是这个没有人优秀的人做设计的话，这对整个国家的经济发展我觉得是非常大的这种这种打击的。那我的问题就是说，我们在座的各位，你们是如何？刚刚你已经讲过了，就如如何来管理你跟客户的这种关系？如何提升设计？在整个产业里面的这种价值？我觉得这个可能是我们大家需要关心和探讨的一个问题。谢谢。I think the challenge is is the we can't go back to the past. 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 We can't go back to And most of the time, you know, from the part of world we we came in, we come we come from. Uh, after some time, it's about the branding of the company. So, if if the company has certain brand, they can put whatever figure they want as design consultancy, and people will pay for it. But let's say if you just graduated from the university, even if you have a brilliant idea, you want to charge ten thousand dollars for your design, most likely nobody's going to pay. So, I think the challenge is if we don't have a unifying, quantifiable mm. value. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's our job as people in the creative economy to help our clients and customers understand the process a little bit more, so that they can actually value it.、Um, for us, we don't do anything unless we're being paid. It's just that's it. Some people say, "Oh, well, can you, you know, just do some mock-ups and show me what it would be like?" And I say, "Yeah, sure. It's going to be ten thousand dollars, and it's going to take us two weeks, and it's going to be three designers, a project manager, and we're going to spend forty hours going through this exact process in order to get you those mock-ups." I say, "But they're just mock-ups." And they say, "Well, you should just do them yourself then, if you think they're just <laughs> mock-ups, right?" And that takes some bravery. That、yeah. takes some courage. And I'll tell you what it does is it keeps bad clients away. And it gives you the time for the good ones, because the good ones actually understand the process and actually value what it is that you're going to do for them, and are going to pay you. You're going to, you're going to have a great relationship rather than working with the people that don't understand the process and aren't going to value it. So it's up to I think it's really up to us to to be those educators and to be a little bit more courageous when we're dealing with with clients. I I agree with with that that,、uh, that, that that's how it should be done. But I also want to say that.、Uh, The, there's a guy called Min Wang uh, uh, who's uh, on the team、uh, crafting the Chinese design policy, and, and one of the things that、uh, he wants to have the design association here in China do, and also、uh, the design association globally do, is to not accept、uh, spec work. So、yeah. uh, make sure that they don't say, "Hey, could you show us this and that?" And then you just give them something, and then maybe you get some royalty, maybe you don't. So, so there's also part of it where we can start to get organized as creatives, and and you are, and it is not a Chinese phenomena. It is、uh, there was just a list, I think, was it on on、uh, the, the the Wall Street、uh, Journal, where it it was, became official that architects and designers are some of the lowest paid workers in the U.S. In Denmark, I can say the the average salary of a designer is a third of the.、Uh, The the average salary for、uh, any Dane. So so this is a, a general problem that people think that oh it's just、uh, creative stuff.、Uh, just show me some stuff. I, imagine if you asked your、uh, lawyer, hey, just draft me a contract. I'll see if I like it or not.、Uh, they would never accept that,、yeah. and they are also organized in a way so they don't do that. So for those of you who are interested, I mean, this is called the no spec movement, and as much as I I believe in it. Again, it's back on us. I mean, I'll get asked to to pitch a big brand, and maybe it's five or six agencies that'll do it, and I'll say, "Sorry, we don't do spec work." And I know three of the other ones being asked are going to do it, and they're some of the biggest agencies in the world, and they've got hundreds of designers.、And、they'll say, "Yeah, whatever," and they'll throw someone at it for a few days, and they're going to show the work, and we then can't compete. Our industry is never going to get together to to unionize or whatever it is to not do spec work. So. We are our own worst enemies in that instance. I'd like to summarize a couple of things.、Um, I think you can feel as well as I can feel. There's a tension here, a creative tension, between systems, be it business or organizations, governments that are 
wanting to have creative economies or creative organizations and creatives who want to be creative but, but, feel, but feel like systems are pressing on them. And, and one of the interesting ways of transcending that conflict might, may well be having more people who honor and respect creative skills. Mm -hmm. All of us at one point in our lives were four years old a long, long time ago. If we think back to when we were four, it doesn't matter what culture or country we came from. We asked lots of questions. We were good at making observations. We were full of creative ideas. And we did this stuff. We were creatives, all of us here. And I suspect as we go forward, be it within our organizations, business, government, or the social sector, one of the things we can do for the generation 10 or 20 years from now is imagine a world where just maybe adults like you and, and me, if we were to change our schools a little bit, behave a little bit differently in our families, have our approaches to how we let kids grow up and raise them to where they actually had a little more honor and respect and maybe even a little more creativity on average by the time they get through school systems. It just may be that in 10 or 20 years, when the World Economic Forum holds another one of these sessions about fueling the creative economy, if we did that together and got the average up a little bit of the average manager being just a touch more creative, that these conversations may not be as critical then. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we have work to do. I think it's been a productive conversation. Thank you all four for your ideas today and insights. Thank you for your attendance questions and input as well. And now the burden's on us to go out of this room and do something about it, and hopefully we'll do it even better than when we walked in today. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.